I've been there for about five years in that role. But uh, prior to that, I was working for the Fort Abraham Lincoln Foundation, which was a uh, nonprofit friends group that operated in the park, uh, hosting events and uh, running the interpretive efforts um, at the state park. Uh, so during the summertime, I coordinate the tours, uh, both of the Custer House at Fort Abraham Lincoln, as well as the Honest Land Indian Village. Uh, we do first person interpretation, third person interpretation um, to guests from all over the United States, as well as around the world that come and visit us. We have about, about 15,000 um, individuals um, that visit and tour the facilities at uh, Fort Abraham Lincoln every summer. Uh, the park itself annually sees about 100,000 in visitation um, throughout the year. Um, a lot of camping, hiking, um, a lot of folks from the local communities of Bismarck and Mandan utilize the park quite frequently. And so part of our goal um, as an events coordinator to the state park is, is coming up with unique experiences that will draw people out to the state park uh, numerous times throughout the year, not just for a, a one single event, but to get them introduced to different aspects of the state park, not just the historical, not just the recreation, but the, kind of the whole package that we have to offer. Um, so we've, we've uh, over the last five years, we've dived into um, experience-based um, programming, which really um, gets folks involved. It gets them connected with the groups that, they're, that are there. It also gets them connected with the state park. And so one of our uh, more successful programs that we've had for uh, quite a long time is the, which I'll be talking about, is the uh, Haunted Fort, which is currently uh, going on throughout the month of October. But um, other kind of um, smaller events that we've implemented over the last few years that have been quite successful in the same type of um, experience-based programming is our 12-month 12 12-hike 12 challenge uh, that we host uh, throughout the year. Uh, we host 12, my, uh, 12 hikes. Um, one every month throughout the year. Um, folks sign up, they register, they participate, and if they can complete 12 hikes um, throughout the year, they earn an annual state park pass for the next season. Um, so it's kind of an incentive-based um, program, but all of our hikes are themed. They're not just a, a regular hike that you get on. Um, our last hike in September was the fall colors hike, so we took a hike that was more aimed at seeing the fall foliage that was happening in September. And then we have fun hikes like our glow hike in August, which um, we had a, just over 1,100 people um, on a guided hike at the state park, which is um, something we've never, ever, ever had in terms of the number of people. Uh, most of our hikes, though, um, are do average anywhere from 150 to 200 people on a guided hike. Um, something that you don't normally see in, in most state parks, that many people um, on a guided hike, but they're coming out to be um, as families, as friends, um, uh, groups of people, and they're experiencing the park in different ways. Another smaller event that we started this summer was the uh, cardio and coffee trail running series, which was a uh, series that did used our multi-purpose trails in the park. And those particular trails, um, we partnered it with a four-mile run and a um, and a um, coffee, brewed coffee. Sorry, <laughs> and I haven't had my coffee this morning, obviously. Uh, and so it was uh, part, partly uh, ed educational on the roasting of coffee and different coffee flavors from around the world. But it was also um, fitness-based as well, getting out there and doing a four-mile trail run. So those were the kind of the things we've dived into, but uh, today I'm going to speak more on the Haunted Fort and how that kind of came about and kind of where we're at today with that event here at the State Park. Okay, so I think you can see what I've got here. There, there's my controls. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so Haunted Fort. And um, if you have questions at all, uh, feel free to just type them in the conversation thing or just pipe on in. Um, I totally open to answering any questions that you have on this topic and um, kind of how it has evolved from not only being in the state park, but it has involved the entire, um, has involved the communities of Bismarck and Mandan as this event um, has uh, grown over the years. So the, um, 
the event Haunted Fort and designing of fear and experiences, basically what we have dived into is basically we design our program, our event is designed around fear. Obviously a haunted house um, type of environment gives you that, that um, fear, but it, it actually goes um, farther back in terms of the historical parts of Fort Abraham Lincoln. But as you can see on your, your screen, um, it has a long fear laced in history. Um, a lot of times historical places um, kind of connect more with that fear aspect in terms of a, of a, of a haunting story or some sort of haunting environment. Uh, we as humans are, um, we're designed to, to fear things. Um, that is just what we are, um, our instincts are from an early child. If you were to, you know, you tell a child and like my kids that there's a monster in the basement and he's scary, they're going to fear the basement. And so we, we kind of nurture that from an early age. Um, and, and a lot of times our fears um, stem from being told what not to do or don't do this, don't do this because this will happen. And so from an early age, we're, we're, we're very much cultured in terms of having fears of certain aspects. And as we grow up, those fears either become more real to us um, you all know probably adults that are scared of certain things, spiders, snakes, um, clowns with uh, creepy red balloons. Uh, and, and it all stems from either some sort of uh, cultural influence, whether it's reading a book or seeing a movie or experiencing some sort of traumatic event. Um, those fears become real in our, in our mental capacity. So as a haunted house director, uh, we actually, I, I dive into those fears and we utilize those fears in our design concepts in creating the experiences that people are going to see as they move through the different haunted spaces. Um, and a lot of it, it revolves around trickery. We, we are tricking your mind um, in a haunted house to feel something that is feeling as real, but is all fake and put on as a scene, as a show. So that's kind of the basis of what we do in a, um, a haunted house environment. So Haunted Fort basically was created in 2002 as an as a initial small one weekend event um, to bring people out to the park to celebrate the Halloween season. And we had games, we had some creepy lantern tours of the Custer House, um, and it kind of grew from there. The, um, it, it grew out of both that event, that first initial event in 20, um, 2002, but it also grew out of this kind of underlying myth and kind of legend that spirits and paranormal had kind of infested the Custer House after it was reconstructed in 1989. Whether those were true, false, or, or made up, those stories continued to kind of grow in popularity and, and a lot of people questioned whether or not the Custer House was truly haunted. And so Haunted Fort kind of grew out of that kind of uh, that legend. Uh, the initial concept that we started with was more historic. Um, we wanted to stick around the, the historical concepts of the park itself, but it was failing. By, 20, um, by 2006, the event itself um, had grown dramatically and then started to drop off. And the reason was that is because our experiences began to become stagnant. We were stuck in this kind of, this, this method of creating the same thing every year and not changing it. We were, we were scared of changing. We were scared of stepping outside of the, the square box we had created, which was Fort Abraham Lincoln and that, that kind of period history that we do. And so in 2007 and eight, when I took over as the, the, the creative director, we began to look at redesigning the event. We looked at redesigning it in terms of becoming a little bit more modern, but utilizing our story and the, the kind of the, the, the historical components of Fort Abraham Lincoln as our underlining foundation. That was gonna be our narrative. And so we started to use that as our narrative, but then grew into creating some more modern um, haunts. Uh, in the first couple of years that we did that in 2007 and eight, it became very, very popular. Um, people started to come out because things were changing. Uh, we were adapting to what the, the public wanted 
at the event that was going to scare them and give them that, that um, unique experience. Uh, in 2010, we took a huge leap and we expanded the event to encompass um, three weekends in October. Uh, that was a huge um, step for us. Uh, a lot of times at state parks, you'll find like a one weekend event uh, and a lot of organizations and communities host uh, one weekend events or different types of events like this. In, 20, uh, in 2010, we actually took that step in, in terms of in, into the seasonal attraction realm. And seasonal attractions are basically uh, seasonal businesses. And these businesses stem all around the country. You'll see them uh, quite popular as pumpkin patches, um, fall uh, hay rides, things like that. Usually it's uh, based out of agritourism. Um, communities oftentimes will get involved in it and having some sort of folk fest um, type of thing in their downtown main streets um, year after year. But seasonal attractions are back, uh, basically an investment. You're investing in this attraction. Um, and on a large scale, we see that happening in um, theme parks. For example, Six Flags, Disney. Those are, those are huge attractions and, and they dump tons of money and capital into building attractions within their theme park. And some of them may be seasonal, some may be haunting uh, haunted houses, some may be a, a uh, winter concept, um, a, a holiday concept as well. So there, th those seasonal attractions come year after year after year and garner a new uh, way of attracting uh, returning guests back to those parks. And we see the same thing in um, the haunted house industry as well. The seasonal attractions that, that people are creating there through a whole month um, are not just a small kind of put it together and then pack it away. Um, we're, we've, we're investing in the infrastructure that we have for this event. As well as now in 2010, since we had multiple weekends, we're paying staff. We, we will hire a core staff, which is our, our scare team. Um, that we've had around now since 2010. So, so all of those things add to this kind of seasonal attraction. Um, as we grew, we began to, again, change our concept. Even though we were beat, we were very successful from 2010 through 2013, we still knew that we had to kind of change and adapt. And so we started creating what we called extreme haunt concepts. These were haunted houses that kind of took one more step in terms of the, the scare factor. It wasn't just your normal maze. It wasn't just your normal uh, freak show type of um, haunt, like with clowns and stuff. This actually dived people and it made people kind of work through it. And so our first um, extreme haunt concept was the, the Dark Hood, which was a hooded event. Um, all the participants that went through the haunt had to wear a, a hood kind of over their head, um, taking away their sight and they had, they had the use of a rope that guided them through the haunt, through the maze. Um, again, very successful. Um, it, it dived into the, the taking away of senses, um, and that extreme haunt continued for four years. Now we have a new one, which I'll talk a little bit more about. It's called the Guard House. Um, so the next level of fear in 2019, you know, this, this event now is the, the leading haunted attraction in the state. Um, I, I shouldn't even say that, in the region, uh, in terms of, um, of a state park. Uh, we see, uh, well, uh, we see over 8,000 people attending this event, obviously not on a weekend like now where we had to close because of the snow, but uh, obviously Haunted Fort is weather dependent. But uh, now this event has, has more of a mission to it. It's not just a fun uh, weekend event that we put on just for the heck of it to kind of bring people out. Um, this event is, is revenue generating. Uh, it generates an, uh, revenue to fund our interpretive program as well as other programs that we do in the state park. And it's creating memorable core experiences that draw people back to the park during our main season. And what I mean by that is it, it's creating impressionable moments within the people that are visiting. So we have young, a very young dem demographic that comes to Haunted Fort probably not the same demographic that would come to Fort Abraham Lincoln during the summertime and want to learn about the history and take the tours. But they're coming out to Haunted Fort, they're having that, that memorable connection with the space, with the Custer House, with Fort Abraham Lincoln. And whether it's a year later, two years, or 10 years later, those core moments stay with them, and those moments then draw them back during our, 
our main season, bringing their families out um, to visit Fort Abraham Lincoln. We hear it over and over again that, you know, they remember coming out as a kid and going to the haunted fort. And now they want to bring their kids out and experience the, the true essence of Fort Abraham Lincoln, which is its, its historical and cultural aspects. And you can go to the next one. There we go. Um, so the real hauntings of Fort Abraham Lincoln um, is not just over the last 18 years. Um, paranormal at Fort Abraham Lincoln has gone back 140 years. Um, there was a lot of accounts historically of uh, back in the 1880s of paranormal happenings at the park. And so that is where we get our narrative from. And that's where we dry, um, draw all of our kind of concepts from and our storylines and, and things like that is going back to the historical components of it. And that's key to designing any type of seasonal attraction is to have a very, very strong uh, narrative, a narrative that you're going to follow uh, conceptually in your story, but also in your themes and um, in your themes and how you're going to design the attraction that you're selling to people. Understanding this type of concept of designing fear, we have to understand a couple of things. We have to understand emotion, which is a, a conscious mental reaction, whether it's anger or fear. Um, it can be sadness, it can be happiness, it can be all kinds of other things too. Um, Subjectively experiences a strong feeling, usually directed towards a specific object, typically accompanied by a psychological or behavioral changes in the body. So, obviously, in, in our case, um, screaming, you know, um, uh, when you get scared, um, shaking, things like that, crying in some cases. But um, that emotion is key. We have to tie into that emotion when we're, we're, we're creating that, that narrative and that connection with the people coming through. We also have to understand fear itself. Um, it's an unpleasant emotion caused by that belief that something or something is dangerous, um, likely to cause pain and threat. But the one thing about fear is fear is, is can be um, nurtured. It can be cultivated. Um, if you are to take an infant child and set them on a floor with a, 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 a spider, for example, They've never had any interaction with that spider or have never had any type of emotional interaction with that. They're not going to be scared of that spider. They're, they're most likely going to be curious. They're going to kind of go up to it. They're going to kind of look around it, maybe even touch, grab, because there's no fear with that concept. And so we have to understand that fear is nurtured because in most cases, if an infant was sitting on a floor with a spider, the, the, the nurturing the, the, the culturing part comes from the parent saying, no, no, don't touch that. Don't touch that. Stay away. Stay away. And that immediately in, in, in signifies to that, that child that that is dangerous or, or be scared. And that emotion falls in. And so that is cultured in us. And so that's why you have folks that are scared of clowns or scared of the dark or, full, or just general legitimate phobias where people, you know, it, it, it affects their day-to-day -day life. That was cultured into them. And so we have to understand that before we even start designing our themes, our haunts, and, and, and the narrative itself is how does that narrative play into the fear that people have, fears, I should say multiple fears, but also how can we um, nurture that? How can we play with that? How can we twist that as part of our event? So a couple of the things that we've done um, in terms of our narrative is we've started breaking out our different haunted houses. And so um, here you'll have the three, four concepts of our of haunted fort. Haunted fort, for example, is made up of four different haunted houses. Uh, we've got the Custer Manor, the Freak Show, the Post Asylum, and then the Guard House. The Custer Manor obviously sticks within our Cust uh, the, the old Custer House that we have reconstructed there. And so there we stick with more of a historical, conceptual type of, of haunt. Um, gives us a little bit more leeway to kind of go into some uh, varying characters that we can bring into the, the place, like uh, Custer's uh, Dent Butler usually is one of our characters that plays a role in that, in that manner. Uh, in the freak show side is more of an old circus clown house. Um, circuses were popular way back in the day. Clowns were, were popular. Gestures go historically go way back. 
And so the lights just turned off on me, obviously, you can see. Uh, um, so we have that, that concept in there. And so Buster the Clown is our kind of character for that. And he's a kind of a, a, a Western um, clown. He's got the campaign hat. Um, and he kind of directs the freak show. Uh, the post asylum basically goes back to the old asylums of the day um, um, that were quite frequently here. And, and plus the fort itself had a lot of kind of a, a psychological um, effects on, on individuals. And so that ties into our narrative as well. And then the guardhouse itself, the guardhouse on the post was obviously a, a detention area. And so the guardhouse, you know, oftentimes you were put in there alone um, if you were uh, disobeying orders or you had gone off post when you shouldn't have, you were obviously put on, on duty in the guardhouse. And so the guardhouse is our extreme experience haunt, and that's a solo immersive. So basically, you have to enter and go through it alone. So you don't have a companion to help you through or to get you through that event. So that's, um, that's our four main kind of attractions that we, we have at um, the Haunted Fort that all ties into the narrative of that um, that place. And on the next screen here, you're, you're going to see kind of some new concepts that we've started bringing to our event. Uh, one of them is part of our the midway at the Haunted Fort. We have a monster shop. We've got a um, concessions area. We've got our zombie paintball battlefield, which I didn't put in here, but that is a um, interactive um, event where you get to basically have a, a paintball gun hooked to a counter and you get to shoot some live zombies as they move through an arena kind of at you. Um, that was new a couple of years ago. Ben Ogden is very successful at the event as a side attraction. And then other side attractions. Um, the cellar is our new haunted craft beer lounge. So we, we talked to a lot of folks and kind of asked what, what would enhance your experience? What would make your experience better? And basically, they, they kind of all came back to us, that older demographic really said they wanted a place to hang out with friends while they were either waiting for people to get there or after the event, after they had gone through. And so the Haunted Craft Beer Lounge kind of came out of that as that um, the craft beer kind of uh, industry right now is very big. Um, it it's fuels a lot of good conversations, a good company, um, and collecting people. And so we're opening that this season okay. as well. And so then on the other side of it, we've got the Darkness okay, Unleashed, which is another experience where we um, basically take our entire haunted fort attraction and turn it upside down. And what I mean by that is we basically cut all of our lighting yeah. effects. Um, you're, you have to navigate your way through the mazes with a glow stick. And so it becomes a, a much more extreme, much more kind of um, focused event on creating your own kind of own experience at that particular event. Beaver. Um, so the the extreme experiences and um, basically yeah. dive into kind of an immersive environments yeah. that distort our senses. And so the guard house, the the hood of the event, the darkness unleashed, all of those are extreme experiences. Thank and you. what happens with those is we actually tie into the senses. And so basically we're looking at sight, touch, sound, smell, taste, all those different things that we can tie into those senses you're going to create that very, very unique kind of core moment, core experience with your, your visitors. Uh, and so with having those extreme experiences give us, gives those folks options. It gives them the opportunity to kind of create their own experience at the event, um, but it also helps to kind of create that core moment. So with Hooded, we took away sight. With the guardhouse, we took away sight and companionship. So you have to go in alone. You can't really see much. you got to feel around as you're going through the, the event. And then in darkness, again, we, we kind of dive into that dark, taking away your sight, uh, limiting your, your, your sense of touch as you go through. Um, by utilizing the glow stick, it also kind of helps with the separation anxiety, kind of breaks you up from the small groups. And so all of those uh, help kind of dive into that extreme experience. So some of the innovations that we've been doing over the last few years at Haunted Fort um, is util utilizing um, CGI video effects um, are very popular at these events. We've 
also dived into some very, very high industry level um, lighting effects. Um, ISO, Android, everything can be done from a mobile phone now these days. And so we can program lights, we can program effects, um, we can create light shows in our, in our haunts, um, um, focus on fog machines even through our iOS devices, music sound, things like that. So we're utilizing more of that technology. We're also using technology on the business side of things as well. Um, we're using um, ticketing, um, online ticketing portals to really dive into getting um, people a, a, a unique and overall good experience from the time they buy the ticket from our website to when they come to the ticket and get in line and, and redeem their ticket as well. Uh, Role-playing haunts, um, uh, where you become more part of the story, that's kind of our um, zombie paintball area where it's more of an interactive environment. Uh, full virtual reality haunted houses, haunted attractions, we haven't really got into that much, but there are attractions out there where you basically do a whole haunted house via a um, video headset that you, you wear and you go through an entire haunted house that way. Um, haunted escape rooms or puzzle rooms, as some may, may know them, are very popular as well. Um, where, again, you're in a haunted environment, a, a, a scene, and you have to navigate your way through the, the, the clues and um, questions and things like that to navigate your way out of the puzzle room or escape room. And then obviously side events have become really popular as well. So you have your main attraction that people are buying tickets for. How do you garner more revenue? By creating these side events. So less scary night. We just had our spookless night on last Saturday, which was really popular for the younger kids to come out and experience Haunted Fort. Um, other kids events. We have our um, kids bash, which is uh, in a couple weekends here. And that's a Sunday afternoon where we do that. And that's just all about having the kids come out and have fun take some down player tours of the Custer House. Actually, one of our 12-month, 12 12-hike 12 challenge is tied in with that event, so we actually go on a small um, hike through a haunted forest. Um, we've got our extreme events that we talked about, the Darkness Unleashed, um, shopping, our monster shop food. We've got our monster grub oven um, this year, again, themed, tied into Haunted Fort. And then, um, um, obviously, our cellar, the craft beer lounge, bringing in some of those more adult demographics and things to kind of tie people in, keep people to spend their money a little bit more and create that, that experience. Um, but in the end, with all of that, um, we found that nothing, nothing beats that real actor scare. And so no matter what you're doing in terms of creating events or running a business or doing anything you know, uh, on, on the main street, for example, that human interaction is key. Um, no matter how much we spend on animatronics, lighting, all that kind of stuff, our real actors are the kind of the real heroes of Haunted Fort. They're the ones who create the best scares, and they're the ones who have the best interaction with the, the individuals and ultimately have that the best um, memorable moments, create the best memorable moments with our guests coming through. Uh, so essentially where we're going with Haunted Fort um, in the next few years is really looking at and diving into visitors, the question that visitors want an authentic experience that's created by them for them. And so by putting all of these things together, having multiple haunts, having the um, concession shop, the zombie paintball, the, the cellar, um, the darkness unleashed, all these different things allow our visitors to the Haunted Fort to really create a unique, a unique experience that they created for themselves. So it's not us producing an experience and then trying to sell that to them. We're producing a space and the environment for them to come out and create that experience. So that, that method can be used universally, not just in haunted houses, but in, in local businesses, um, local events, um, community um, activities, is looking at how can that experience level go up, whether it's a business, uh, an activity, and how do you create that memorable moment that, that brings them back, that ties them in, connects them to that the space, the business, the product, and by doing that, it, it creates that repeat customer. It also creates that dedicated 
kind of individual, that supporter of your activity event, um, things of that sort. So that's kind of an overview of Haunted Fort um, and kind of where we're at with it. Um, like I said, we're in our 18th season um, this year and uh, it looks to be, except for this weekend, obviously with the snow, uh, looks to be a great, a great season um, going forward and we have um, great plans for the next couple of years to really kind of expand it and, and, and grow this event within the Bismarck Mandan community and throughout the state as well. So um, I was just saying, Matt, it's really amazing that um, you've been able to, to develop such a cool experience um, and not only, you know, find a way to keep the same elements so that people know what they're getting into when they want to come back again year after year, but also creating something new um, so that it's a little bit different every year. And I've got a ton of questions for you, but um, I don't know if anyone else has a question first. Does anyone else on the call have a question for Matt? Okay, perfect. Well, um, kind of what I was just referring to then, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you find the balance between keeping things, this, some of the same core elements reliable and the same, but also finding something new and interesting to do every year. How do you balance that? Um, we basically look at kind of where, what our successes are every year and kind of what our failures are. So as of like this, month right now i mean we've we've got everything set the design concepts that we have that we've implemented were set back in may during our initial stages of, of design and development and so during this month we're really looking at kind of what's working what's not working and then we're already coming up with a game plan for 2020 so i'm already gone through walked through with my staff looked at what's working and kind of look at those particular areas and go, okay, is this is this scene working? Is it is it is it creating? Is it connecting? Is it flowing right? Um, a lot of times, our our biggest hurdles that we run into is whether or not people are flowing through the the, the scene um, in those haunts like we we need them to. Um, and so those types of concepts we start to make notes of and we look at the next following season. Um, most of our haunts are on a four, three to four year cycle. And so right now we've, we just finished, for example, the, the freak show was a brand new maze last year. And we completely gutted our entire, um, clown house prior to that and, um, tore everything down, looked at it and, and just rebuilt the entire thing back up. And so that will be a, a good three or four year experience. And, and within those three to four years, we take certain concepts within that house, change them up, move things around, um, create new characters within there. And so that the space is changed just enough when people are coming through that it, it, it provides that, that new experience for them. Um, in terms of adding new things to the event, um, we basically look at Haunted Fort like any other business does. We have a, a, a strategy plan with it, a business plan, and we look at what are some what are some things we want to add in the next you know, two years? What are some things we want to add in the next three years uh, to this event? Uh, and and it, it, it all revolves around not only activities, but infrastructure. Um, it involves um, uh, our hiring, our, our staffing. This year we implemented a new um, uh, employee level, which is our team leaders. And so we're trying to basically use our some of our core actors and elevating them to a leadership role at the event and that gives them a little bit more vested interest in the event itself but it also ties them in closer and and gives them a, a little bit of you know kind of um good good feelings about it they've created something that the, the public likes and it gives them some say um, in the event itself and so we really take this seasonal attraction like Haunted Fort, and, and it's treated like a business. Thanks for sharing that. Um, you have a really wide range of people who attend this, people of all ages and demographic backgrounds. And I know that you do some pretty robust marketing. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what types of marketing you use and how you target different groups of people. Yeah, sure. So our marketing basically um, 
is all done in house. Um, I know down the road we we have talks about trying to um, connect with a um, a PR firm of some sort to to help us with this. Uh, it is a very very um, strenuous part of the job. It's just marketing and getting out there and 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 talking about the event. Um, it doesn't just happen on its own. But um, we use a lot of the um, uh, a lot of guerrilla marketing tactics. So we do a lot of um, the social media experiences. Um, we do a lot on Facebook, Instagram. Um, we know that a lot of our demographic uses those uh, platforms, um, more so Instagram than Facebook. And so we've been doing more focused on that platform this season. Um, but we also hit some of the traditional ones. And so we partner with the local uh, radio station iHeartMedia this season um, as a sponsor of the event and so they're out there talking about the event as well promoting it on their stations and then we also bring them in as, as well and so one of the experiences that I didn't really talk about in the presentation that we we create is we actually have a red carpet experience and so as people are entering into the haunt uh, prior to going through they're kind of in a queue line they eventually come to a space that has a big red carpet a huge banner and they get to have their photo taken as a group, individual, whatnot. And then they can obviously share those photos via any type of platform. Um, but the radio station actually um, does that for us as part of their um, partnership with the event. And so that ties the radio station in as well as it gives folks a unique kind of thing to take with them or to share with their family and friends. And, and again, that's another part of our marketing. They're, they're sharing it, they're posting about it, uh, and so that's going out to their friends and family that watch their platforms and, you know, ultimately, hopefully garner some repeat visitation as well to the event. Good deal. Thanks for sharing that. Does anybody have a question for Matt? I've scared them all away. <laughs> well, I still got some questions. Um, so this went from, it sounds like being a shorter term event to what's now a multi-week event. Um, and I'm wondering, are there any challenges associated with hosting an event like this that does last for so many weeks? Um, yeah, the biggest challenges are our infrastructure. Obviously, you can see on the screen in front of you, we've got um, a lot of our midway is, is um, large event tents, so we don't have um, very... Uh, we don't have a lot of brick and mortar for the, those types of act activities. And so right now, obviously, when it's snowing out, um, you know, there we're dealing with having trying to make sure the tents stay up for a month plus time period. And so infrastructure is obviously a, an issue. I mean, we've got parking on our grasses and stuff like that. And so that inhibits some of our um, that, that has an effect when you when you operate for a full month, especially um, weather if, it, if weather events are, are consistent. Um, the other part for us, and I think any business runs into it, I, I know holiday businesses run into it a lot during the Christmas season, is, is, is finding dedicated staff. Um, finding staff that want to want to actually work and come out to the event. Um, we have we have we have our good good handful of, of long-term staffers that are just absolutely wonderful. They have such a passion for being part of this this event and, and this attraction. And so, you know, we have one uh, gentleman that's on his 10th year with us. Um, he started volunteering and then just joined up as a paid staffer um, way back in, I think, 2010, 11. And he's been with us ever since. And so um, he's been one of our, our, our icons. He's one of our, our leaders in the event, um, training all of our new staff that come in. But uh, that is probably one of our biggest hurdles, is just having the staff um, available. Uh, for this event, we actually use a little bit of both. We use staff and volunteers. And so our staff are actually go through a pretty rigorous um, training that we take them through where um, they're, they go through all the safety features and safety protocols for our event. Uh, they go through uh, fire extinguisher training, uh, CPR um, training as well emergency services type of thing so that they're ready in case of an emergency in any one of our buildings. Um, obviously safety comes first when we're looking at this event and so 
they're in charge not only of the public going through, but they're also in charge of the volunteers that we get out. So on a given night, we may have anywhere from 30 to 40 to sometimes 50 volunteers, mostly high school kids coming out to help um, on a night. And so those staff are in charge of them, plus the actual product itself. And so our, our staff are key to the, the success of this event and it being a, a long-term kind of month-long event as well. What are some tactics that you use for recruiting the volunteers that you have? Um, we've, we basically use a lot of social um, tactics for that. So we get on social media, we get our staff to share about volunteering for the event. Um, we use um, a online portal for volunteers, signup.com, for them to easily sign up for whatever night they want to. Um, so that, that helps a lot. Uh, we send notices out to the different uh, career offices at the high school level as well as at the college level. Um, we also send notices out to um, um, teachers at different high schools as well. Uh, we know that most of the high schools in our area uh, require their students to have some sort of community service time as well, especially for like National Honor Society and other things. So those, um, we get a lot of those that come out to the, the Haunted Fort that are trying fill those hours as well. This is probably a pretty popular volunteer opportunity for um, high school <laughs> students. Yeah, I imagine. It it's tends probably to be on the top of everyone's list. Yeah, it's probably a lot more exciting than some other things they could be doing. Um, Matt, this is Kim in Beach, and I just have a question regarding insurances. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we used to have a haunted house here some years back, and um, it ended up having to be closed down because of liability reasons. So do you, um, do you experience that at all as far as with insurances and, um, you know, coverage for the organization? Well, so there is, um, there is, there is insurance out there. Um, a haunted Fort, fortunately enough, um, mm -hmm. is, a, is a state run event. And so we fall into the, the risk management realm um, for this event. Um, but there is insurance out there. There's actually a, a, the National Haunted House Association, um, which is a, a national kind of group that if you are a private haunted house owner, you can actually get membership with them. And they have um, services for helping people through those types of business, the business end of things, whether it's um, liability insurance um, for events, um, even as far as attorney services um, for if you if someone does get injured on your property if you're a member of that that association um, but there are insurance companies out there nationally that that um, specialize in um, haunted houses and haunted house coverage uh, we had when we when we when this event was run by the Fort Abraham Lincoln Foundation we had to do an add-on for the month. Um, so the general liability insurance that the organization had, we would have an add-on put onto it during the month of September and October that was specific for a haunted house. And so the question there for it is, is quite hilarious because it's, you know, it asks like, do you have chainsaws? Um, you know, what is the percentage of darkness in your building? Um, the, the width of hallways and things like that as well. Um, so all of those things kind of play a role in, in the kind of the coverage area. We also on our end, just for safety as well, we actually work with the, the state fire marshals to come out and they actually come out and, 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 and inspect the event as well and give us, you know, um, uh, suggestions on things we need to change. Obviously with a haunted ex event like this, um, they're concerned about, um, exits, um, emergency exits, ways out of the buildings, all those different things. And so there is a lot of resources for it out there. Okay. I appreciate the information. Yeah. Hey, Matt, are there any other resources that you would suggest people look into, whether they're for specifically like haunted houses or just any type of seasonal events? Um, yeah. So there's, there's the seasonal uh, attraction, um, Seasonal Entertainment Source, which is a magazine that talks all about um, kind of seasonal attractions. And, and that's a good source for kind of um, 
inspiring ideas, stories, and, and how people have gone about creating seasonal attractions in different communities. Um, that's a great source to use as well. The other source too is, is just to kind of, you know, find some, if you're a community, for example, and you're looking to do something um, that's a seasonal attraction in your community as an event type of thing, is to kind of do some research on other communities that are doing the same thing. Um, a lot of these communities really like to share kind of where they're at and how they're going in terms of in terms of a seasonal attraction and every state is different you know so that's one thing i found when we when we started really diving into this is that every state has different policies and procedures and requirements for these types of attractions um, haunted houses in most states fall under a a theme park um, kind of policy management and so the same agencies that that go and inspect your Six Flags theme parks are the same agencies that go and inspect the local haunted houses in those states. Our state, uh, North Dakota, doesn't really have anything like that right now. Um, we're kind of just on the, the the leading edge in terms of haunted fort and other attractions in terms of you know policies. And so a lot of the policies and procedures that we do at Haunted Fort we've created ourselves. Um, but I did you know I attended multiple. Um, Halloween attraction shows and seasonal attraction shows that are held across the country and a lot of them have really good kind of educational seminars on you know those topics you know safety um, the business end of things insurance uh, hiring staff um, those types of things because all these haunted houses are, are, are dealing with those same things just like any normal business um, would deal with um, one other question I have you know people talk a lot about um, seasonal events that they're doing in their community. We hear about the Christmas, you know, Christmas events or Halloween specifically, or, you know, some in the spring and summer. And I'm wondering what suggestions you might have for communities who are looking to either start their own recurring seasonal event or to expand one that they already have. Um, yeah, so the, the biggest thing would be if, if you were looking to start or even expand it is I would dive into what is the what is the narrative that you're trying to tell you know as a seasonal attraction um, anyone can open up a haunted house you know and I use that as an example obviously because of haunted fort but it's not going to really um, connect with people unless you have that narrative so if you look at many of the successful haunted houses across the nation most of them have tied into some sort of storyline, whether it's in their community, whether it's in the building that they're they're utilizing, and they they own it, and so that's kind of key. If you're if you're going to start a seasonal attraction, whether it's a holiday experience, a haunted house experience, a summertime experience, whatever it may be, the narrative that connects it to your community and what makes your community unique, its people unique, that's key. That will that will really elevate the the attraction and the experience because once you have that narrative everything that you're doing in terms of creating that event fall should fall into that narrative and so then you have a guideline you just don't have random things happening you know so if you go to for example um, there was a, an attraction that was in LA for the the last ice age or no My kids loved the movie, and I can't remember the movie. It was about a some abominable snowman guy. Anyways, there was an attraction with that. Person. Person, yeah. And so it was it was a, a, a um, DreamWorks movie, and they did this this did this ice attraction, and everything was themed within that, that space. And it wasn't a parking lot, but your concessions, the food, all fell into the the theme and the experience. Even the garbage cans fell into that narrative. So all the things that you normally have to have in any type of event, you know, you could just go and be normal garbage cans. But if you create that garbage can fall into the narrative and the theme of your of the attraction, it it just elevates that experience. And so, an, uh, um, I mean, a good, great example of a community that does that in North Dakota is Garrison, with the um, with their um, their holiday event. Um, They've got the double decker bus. They've got the Victorian Christmas stuff. They everything in that community is is themed and falls into that narrative, and that's a great example of 
of a seasonal attraction um, in North Dakota as well. Thank you so much, Matt. So stay warm and we'll talk with you soon.